Hello guys, Winston here. A couple months ago, I shared a video of some of the things I saw when I went to Cape Canaveral to attend a NASA social event, an outreach program that grants up to 50 lucky members of the public who are active on social media an opportunity to attend a rocket launch or some other cool event like an engine test. What I never got around to doing was actually explain what I got to see there, so today I'm going to fix that. I'm hoping I can coherently convey at least a tiny fraction of what I learned about the science and engineering that go into a NASA mission. The launch I attended was Commercial Resupply Mission 5. The objective for this launch was to restock the ISS with provisions that had been lost on Orb 3 when an Antares rocket had to be self-destructed due to a critical failure shortly after launch. Also on the agenda was the delivery of additional experiments to the ISS like cats. Sadly, not like real cats. Let's start at the beginning though. On December 18th, I arrived at NASA's press badging site and got my credentials to enter KSC. From there, my 49 new best friends and I made our way to the media campus where our NASA social coordinator informed us that CRS-5 had been delayed by about two weeks. We were, of course, disappointed, but because the scientists who'd been scheduled to do a pre-launch press briefing were already on site, we got our own personal preview of the experiments being sent up on the upcoming launch. The coolest mission, in my opinion, was the Cloud Aerosol Transport System experiment, known as CATS for short. It's a multi-spectral laser imaging attachment for the International Space Station. Its purpose is to map the movement of clouds, dust, and other particulates through the atmosphere. CATS will help us better understand things like how dust from Africa fertilizes the rainforests of South America, or where pollution from China actually ends up. The ISS was designed to be a modular platform for research, and experiments like CATS can be installed onto standardized data, power, and cooling ports on the Kibo module. This flexibility helps NASA and other researchers make the best use of the station and maximize the amount of science that can be done there. Also going up on CRS-5 was an interesting experiment involving fruit flies. Because microgravity has numerous poorly understood effects on terrestrial biology, it's useful for scientists to observe the growth and development of animals in space. Fruit flies are perfect for this because they have short life cycles and a well understood genetic structure. The Ames Research Center's Fruit Fly Lab on CRS-5 was intended to study the effects of microgravity on the immune system. This is important because microgravity has been observed to do two generally bad things. Number one, cause reduced immune response in organisms, and two, increase the virulence of certain pathogens. Unfortunately, because this was a living experiment, every time a launch was scrubbed, someone had to retrieve the lab box from the cargo capsule and swap in fresh fruit flies and food. This happened twice. After several other briefings, which I found humorous because nearly everyone in attendance was busy machine gunning tidbits of information to their social media networks, we ended the day by visiting the Space Cathedral, otherwise known as the Vehicle Assembly Building. This 50 plus story building is where NASA used to stack up the stages of the Saturn V and mate the space shuttle to its boosters. Now it's being renovated to house NASA's future space launch system, which will be, in a word, huge. We woke up bright and early the next morning to catch a tour bus that would take us around some other facilities at the Kennedy Space Center. Our first stop was Launch Complex 39B, formerly used for shuttle launches. The pad was undergoing extensive renovations in preparation for the future launch of the SLS. We got to walk into the flame trench, which would soon have a new layer of thermal tiles installed to withstand launch conditions. The second stop was to see the mobile launch platform. Instead of the large swinging gantry setups that were used during the shuttle era, the SLS will be rolled out to the pad attached to its launch tower. The platform seen here was being retrofitted for this purpose. Lastly, on this SLS theme day, we were lucky enough to witness the welcome home ceremony for the recently tested Orion capsule. This won't be the spacecraft that'll ferry astronauts into low Earth orbit like the manned Dragon or CST-100 capsules, but hopefully instead to go to Mars and beyond, federal budget permitting. Exploration Flight Test 1 was a complete success on all major counts, with the only failure being that one of the flotation devices failed to remain inflated throughout recovery. That concluded our guided tour of the Kennedy Space Center. As a consolation prize for missing out on an actual launch, we were comped tickets to go to the NASA Visitors Complex, home of various rockets and exhibits, not the least of which was the Space Shuttle Atlantis. At the end of the day, we packed up our bags and went home to await the next launch window. We returned to NASA the next year, a day before the scheduled launch for the official press briefing. We'd already heard about the experiments going up, but we got additional statements from the Air Force and SpaceX about how the launch would proceed. Most of the questions from the media were about how SpaceX would attempt to land the first stage of its Falcon 9 rocket on an autonomous spaceport drone ship. Between briefings, I may or may not have snuck onto the stage for a few photo ops and taken part in a parody NASA news segment. 
A couple hours before each launch, photographers are usually allowed to visit the pad to get some close-ups with the rocket and leave remote cameras behind. My NASA social group went out with them and I was able to see my first operational rocket in person. The people leaving cameras at the pad usually armor up their gadgets in some way. Sometimes their protective devices are as simple as a mailbox, sometimes it's a custom crafted sheet metal blast shield. These contraptions serve two purposes. The first is thermal shielding. Even behind the fence line, the radiated heat from the combustion of hundreds of kilograms of RP-1 fuel and oxygen per second is enough to shorten the lifespan of any camera gear. The second purpose is to deflect or otherwise weather the downdraft from nine Merlin engines. Most, if not all, tripods set up on the field are staked down to prevent them from being blown over, and it's not uncommon to use sacrificial viewports on them to keep your camera lenses from being sandblasted. This is the insanity I'm hoping to partake in with my vacuum-formed plexiglass smartphone case, so fingers crossed here that my next NASA social application is accepted. Once everyone had set up their cameras and gotten in the obligatory selfie, we were treated to our hotels for the night. Our launch window was 6am and buses loaded at 4.30. Barely six hours after leaving KSC, we returned to board a bus that would take us to the causeway, the closest point from the launch pad you could possibly be as a member of the general public. With about an hour to go, people set up their cameras and entered a Twitter frenzy. The launch proceedings were broadcast over a loudspeaker as we entered terminal count. Everything was looking good. VCDC start. The terminal count auto sequence set to start at T minus 10 minutes. Covered. Then, with a minute and 21 seconds to go, a mission abort was called over a misbehaving thrust vector control actuator. It was an enormous disappointment for me, and even more so for the people who'd flown across the country twice to be a part of this. Unfortunately, that's just how rocket science goes sometimes. There was no press conference this time, just a singular focus on launch. Those of us who could make it back to the Cape went out to the launch pad viewing and remote camera setup in the late hours of the night. By 4.30am, we were on the causeway again. Morale was admittedly a little lower. We weren't just tired of delays, we were also physically more tired. Every day the mission was postponed, the launch window was moved up by five minutes. The timing was dictated by orbital precession of the space station. There were also no loudspeakers set up this time, just Twitter updates and NASA's staff with walkie-talkies keeping us appraised of the mission's status. At T-8 minutes, I started recording on my D5100. At T-6 minutes, I started on my iPhone 4S. And at T-2 minutes, I started rolling on my D5300. Night launches are one of the most challenging events to shoot, not because of how dark things are, but because of how bright things get when the rocket goes up. Without some quick thinking and on-the-fly adjustments, your shots are most likely going to come out overexposed. And mine were, because my brain shut off as soon as the Falcon 9 cleared the tower. The rocket was pretty much like a mini sun rising up from the ground, radiating enough heat to be felt four miles away. The sound hits you about eight seconds later, starting as a low rumble before you hear the crackle of the engines throttling up and ripping a hole in the atmosphere. Eight minutes after launch, you have main engine cutoff. Two minutes after that, and the first stage is firmly on its way back to Earth, with everyone at SpaceX hoping it would stick the landing on the drone ship. Of course, as most of you probably know, it didn't. It failed spectacularly, as did CRS-6's landing in April. The next attempt at a Falcon 9 powered landing will probably be at the end of June. I know this was a really long-winded video that still fails to do the experience justice, but I hope you can at least kind of understand why I think space exploration is an amazing endeavor. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and hopefully I'll be able to attend another launch soon, but until that opportunity comes around, I'll be sticking to my comparatively boring Earthbound projects.